I think a lot of you are hearing a, a, a lot about, of course, is vaccine and vaccine distribution. Uh, lots of good conversations on that, both from the federal level uh, and to us, and then inside the state and to our, our private partners. So the one thing I can uh, tell you as Minnesotans that a lot of thought over many months has gone into this. Uh, as I've said many times, I feel uh, very comfortable and grateful for the federal partnership around vaccine development and vaccine distribution. And there'll be more on that as we get into the early part of next week because the information is still pretty, uh, pretty new. But the, the sad reality is we're reporting uh, over 5,000 cases again today um, and 61 of our neighbors uh, dying. Uh, that has been an unrelenting and heartbreaking math that has been going on for quite some time. As we said, um, one way that we change those numbers is by changing some of our behaviors. And unfortunately, both here in Minnesota and across the country, COVID-19 has proved incredibly dangerous to those with underlying health conditions and the elderly. And long-term care facilities, and I, I think one of the things, uh, Commissioner Malcolm was talking about this this morning, and you're gonna hear from some professionals who provide this. That once again is one of those terms that we use when we get around using the data. Those 61 deaths are 61 people. Those are 61 loved ones. Those are 61 people with a lifetime of stories and contributions. Long-term care is home. These are homes. These are, these are places where people are loved and, and added another part of their life. And in, in many cases, this is the part of your life you work so hard for. This is the part you work for to enjoy time with your grandkids, to enjoy those activities that you like. And there's not one model of a long-term care facility that is the same and uh, across this state. The one thing we do know is it's very dangerous with COVID-19 and the behaviors that we exhibit impact them. And I think it was hard early on to think about why this was happening. There were a lot of people said, well, why don't you, you know, just put up a fence around those places and not let anybody in? Because folks have to care for them. Folks have to come in and do the things pre-COVID, uh, whether it's preparing food or changing linen or being there to help with programming, all of those things. Those people don't live there. They live in your communities. And they stop on the way home and pick up their children from daycare. Um, it's those places that if you're not wearing a mask or your child gets it and, and they pass it on and it goes to that person and then they take it into a care facility. And the crisis starts to become is, what happens when everybody in a care facility is not there to work? What happens to the people who are living there? These are our parents. They need someone there to be able to care for them. And plans were put out. We had a five-point battle plan early on that we created. Um, and we're relying on our private sector partners that care deeply about their residents and their neighbors. It's their families who are there, living there. Um, and we also, once again, asked for our National Guard to be of help. And you're going to hear today, you'll hear a little bit of a, a detailed uh, dive on long-term care and what's happening there. Uh, from Commissioner Malcolm. You'll hear from our Adjutant General, Sean Mankey. We'll talk a little bit about the guards role in this. And then I think, and I hope all of you who hear this, uh, two folks who understand this, what it means to care for our seniors, what it is to be in there, what it takes to manage these facilities, and what we can do to help them make their job easier. I asked you to help make it easier on police, firefighters, and EMTs. I've asked you to help make it easier on frontline nurses and doctors in the emergency room. Today, I'm asking you, Minnesota, let's make it easier on these care providers, which by extension, helps protect the lives and safety of our seniors. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Jan Malcolm, Minnesota Department of Health. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Well, as the Governor said, uh, we have another day of 61 Minnesotans having died, almost 5,400 new cases. And around the country, the numbers are just staggering. 100,000 total Americans in the hospital, um, 217,000 average cases over the last few days in a single day. That's just, these are stunning numbers. And uh, sadly, our second day in a row of over 2,700 Americans having lost their lives in a single day. But we're here today, uh, really, as the governor said, to talk about um, the, the important work going on in long-term care and our job as, uh, as members of our communities to help support this work. We, um, excuse me, um, we started off, um, even before we had the first case confirmed in Minnesota, knowing about this emerging global threat and talking with um, our long-term care or congregate care facilities about how to prepare. 
Now, when we talk about long-term care or congregate care, we're talking certainly about nursing homes, but also about assisted living facilities, group homes, mental health and substance abuse treatment facilities, and the like. Residents of these facilities include not only seniors, but younger adults as well who are living with illness, traumatic injuries, memory loss, or disabilities of various kinds. Together, these are some of the most vulnerable Minnesotans for getting COVID-19, having severe disease, and unfortunately, dying from COVID. Even before Minnesota's first COVID case, we were working on how to share information about the emerging threat and what needed to be done in long-term care settings to protect these vulnerable Minnesotans. That work has continued all throughout this year. Between March and November, our State Health Department has helped more than 3,230 facilities with infection control measures. And to date, our staff has made more than 567 visits, some in person, many virtually, for infection control and technical assistance. And all nursing homes in Minnesota have had on-site visits with a special focus on infection, infection control. Now, the governor mentioned the five-point plan that he directed us to develop in May, harvesting some of the early, early and difficult, I will say, lessons of those first months to figure out how we could bring to scale a, a really a focused effort to work with our long-term care facilities. This plan was focused especially, but not only, but especially on seniors living in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. The plan has made facilities safer and has helped to reduce the number of COVID-19 outbreaks in these facilities. We have a, a quite a full update on our health department website, but I just want to give you a few brief highlights uh, as a reminder of the important progress that's been made on this plan. The first point on, this, uh, on, the, on the five point plan had to do with expanding testing for both residents and workers in long-term care facilities. We developed testing criteria to expand testing and a process for facilities to get testing services and to get help with getting those services into their facilities for residents and workers. This testing capacity was initially made possible through the Minnesota National Guard and then has also transitioned to the support of health systems, physician services, and private entities. I will say that considerable capacity still exists to assist facilities with specimen, specimen collection of, uh, statewide through uh, the State Emergency Operations Center where we are today. So I would again encourage facilities to reach out for that assistance if, if you are in need of it. The second point of the plan was to not only uh, increase the testing supplies, but also to troubleshoot to help uh, clear barriers for facilities to be able to get access to that testing. And by late November, we were testing up to 60,000 tests per week in long-term care settings, which was uh, just an enormous uh, improvement over those early days when there was barely any testing at all available in long-term care. Since April, the State Emergency Operations Center has coordinated testing for more than 750 long-term care facilities and 170,000 staff and residents. In November alone, teams uh, supported by the State Emergency Operations Center collected samples by swabbing as many as 120 facilities each week. The third point of the five-point plan was to get personal protective equipment to facilities when needed. And since April, we've pushed out literally hundreds of thousands of face masks, millions of gloves, and other supplies in several waves of proactively distributing these supplies to our long-term care partners. The fourth point was to assist facilities with a very difficult task, which frankly long predated the COVID pandemic, but the pandemic has absolutely exacerbated it. And that, are, that is the, the challenge of providing adequate staffing levels uh, for even the hardest hit facilities. We launched a process to deploy the National Guard and also some federal staffing support teams that we requested and received from the United States Public Health Service to assist with staffing crises. And over the past uh, several weeks, these teams have been physically on site providing hands-on care in 12 facilities in our state. In addition to this extraordinary support for which we're very grateful, we have stood up uh, a, a volunteer matching uh, software system called a LADTAC, which assists us to help 
fill uh, requests for staffing shifts with individual volunteers who've registered through, uh, through this system. And in, in just in the month of November alone, we were able to assist with the placement of individuals within facilities needing help for a total of 339 shifts. The last point in the uh, focused plan was to really better leverage our partnerships so that we were taking full advantage of, this, of the skills uh, of all of our partners, particularly those closest to the long-term care facilities in their communities. And across the state, our local public health providers and partners have been just instrumental in providing outreach, consultation, and support to our long-term care facilities by providing this support we've been talking about with testing, staffing, facilitating connections between long-term care and the acute care healthcare systems, and offering infection control consultation. So we're very, very grateful for the role of local public health in addition to the state health department. A lot of progress has been made here. This work on building a strong flood wall to help keep cases down in these facilities has helped us to remain in pretty good shape, actually, compared with other states. And, and that is something to be celebrated. According to the most recent data from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, Minnesota ranks 31st out of the 50 states in average cases per 1,000 residents. And, that, uh, and this is an area where you want the closer to 50, the better. You want to have the least amount of cases per population. So being 31st out of 50 uh, puts us in, in reasonably good stead, and we will strive to, to keep moving that number uh, down. Uh, so 31st out of 50 states in a number of cases per 1,000 residents, as you can see on this chart. And we rank just slightly less well on resident average deaths per 1,000 resident. We are number 27 out of 50. And again, when it comes to these metrics, the closer we are to number 50, the better. And we strive to, uh, to get there. So thanks to these efforts, we have been able to slow the spread of COVID-19 in long-term care over the summer and fall months. Those protections, that flood wall as we keep referring to it, have remained in place, working well, frankly, even after the state started to, uh, to see rapid acceleration in cases at, as a whole. But unfortunately, even the strongest flood walls uh, aren't sufficient if the waters rise high enough. And in recent weeks, we've been talking about exactly that, the dramatic increase in community transmission and what that might mean for our long-term care facilities. We knew that all the effort putting, put into keeping COVID-19 from spreading in these facilities, those efforts that we put into expanding safe visitation policies, all of that effort could be undermined by continuing out of control community spread. And in the latest data, we are seeing indeed that long-term care facilities are being impacted by the surrounding community spread. In this chart, um, you can see uh, with the, the, the the green line that goes vertical in, uh, in later October and November, uh, that's the statewide total. The line on the bottom, much more stable, uh, reflects the number of cases in long-term care facilities. However, you can see that line starting to tick up as well. The only reason that doesn't look more dramatic is because of the scale on the vertical axis. Uh, so this does represent um, increases in long-term care cases that we are concerned about. From September through the end of October, New cases in the overall population in Minnesota increased by 73%, while new cases in long-term care facilities increased only 15% in that same uh, September to October timeframe. But from the beginning of October to the end of November, new cases in the state population and in long-term care both increased by more than 400% in just that, uh, that two-month period. So you can see there that that, is, uh, that has, has really, as we keep saying, that flood wall uh, has been, has been, uh, is being breached. And this is a picture of the trends in the, in the deaths among long-term care residents, which again, we strive to, to reduce to the absolute lowest degree possible. And we have done a good job collectively in reducing long-term care deaths as a percent of total deaths in Minnesota. That number was as high as 86% back in April. We got that down and it had been steadily falling uh, down to about 60% of all deaths being among the residents of long-term care facilities of this, of this broad, um, broad definition of the sector, as I mentioned. 
Uh, but unfortunately, the high rates of community transmission are uh, starting to see cases increase, hospitalizations increase, and that is almost inevitably followed by increases in deaths among long-term care residents as well, which you can also see that, that slight uptick on this chart as well. And as we've mentioned many, many times, the COVID min problem in Minnesota is truly statewide. According to our county positivity data, the 14-day county positivity rate is above 5% in 86 counties, above 10% in 71 counties, above 15% in 34 counties, and even above 20% in four of our counties. And here on this map, you can just see as the, the weeks progress there, that's a five week look. The darker, uh, the darker the color in the county, the higher the concentration of cases per population. And you can just see that map filling in over the last five weeks. And higher rates of virus transmission in the counties and in these communities increases the risk for all community members. Everybody in those communities is at higher risk of getting COVID. And especially that translates into the higher risk for staff working in long-term care and bringing it into the facilities and putting the residents and other staff uh, at risk. And we talk a lot about the importance of staffing. I mentioned that earlier. Um, we're working today with 57 facilities that are ha having some degree of staffing crisis to try to support them with these uh, uh, different me methods that I've mentioned. Um, but we see here on this graph what, what has transpired with cases in healthcare workers increasing at a rapid rate just in parallel with what's happening in the general community. Um, and so uh, even as these facilities are working so hard, and you're going to hear from a couple of our leaders shortly, to, uh, to protect their residents and their staff, this prevalence in the community really threatens to undermine that progress. So we are unfortunately seeing the effects of increased community spread in these facilities that care for our most, some of our most vulnerable Minnesotans. And, and unfortunately, what this has meant directly is that due to community spread, many facilities have had to, had to reduce again the number, uh, the, the ability to visit loved ones, which is very painful anytime, uh, but particularly around this holiday se season when so many people are eager to connect with their loved ones in these facilities. You're going to hear from two providers and uh, I'm going to turn this over in a moment to my colleague uh, to talk about how the latest surge in community spread is affecting workers, families, and residents. These stories are important to highlight, as the governor has said, because these are the real stories behind the numbers of how COVID is affecting such important parts of our community and our neighbors. And we are so close now to seeing the next phase, the next chapter in this journey with, uh, with uh, vaccine becoming available in, uh, in the relatively near future so we can begin to protect these vulnerable people. Um, but this is the time to dig deep, to do everything we can, as the governor has said so often, to get as many of our fellow Minnesotans as we can over that bridge to that time when vaccines can help us stamp this virus out and return us to normal. But there's a lot we must do in the meantime. So with that, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce my colleague, uh, Adjutant General Mankey of the National Guard. Thank you, Commissioner Malcolm. Uh, I'm Major General Sean Mankey, the Adjutant General of the Minnesota National Guard. I'd like to open by saying how proud I am of what our soldiers do, not only for the state of Minnesota, but of course for our nation. To say that 2020 has been a busy year for the Guard would be an understatement. It has truly been the year of the Guard. Our soldiers and airmen have been engaged throughout the state this year in the COVID fight, responding to civil unrest, as well as preparing for and executing our federal mission all over the world. As of today, the Minnesota National Guard has nearly 600 soldiers and airmen supporting the state of Minnesota in the COVID battle. This week you've heard from critical staffing issues due to the spread of the virus throughout the state. It's affecting hospitals, first responders, and it is also severely affecting the professionals who care for our residents in long-term care facilities. Unfortunately, the shortage continues to get worse. Facilities and their staffs are becoming overwhelmed by COVID. The state has run out of trained professionals to fill these critical roles and serve and care for our most vulnerable populations. 
When I was first approached by the state regarding guardsmen filling the role of temporary nurse aides for facilities with COVID infected staff shortages, I obviously had concerns. I wondered what this would do to our force, to our retention. I wondered what this would do uh, and how our soldiers would respond. But I also knew at the end of the day, we're all soldiers and airmen. We follow orders. If this is what our state needed us to do, this is what we would do. And if we're going to do it, we would equip and train our force for the mission. In consultation with the Department of Health and the Department of Public Safety, we developed a training plan to train our non-medical soldiers and airmen to care as temporary nurse aides. The training is conducted by medical professions and certified by the Department of Health. We currently have more than 270 guardsmen assigned to 11 teams trained in conducting this role in facilities throughout the state with an additional 100 coming into the training pipeline. I know I am safe in saying not one of our soldiers or airmen envision themselves performing, performing care in a long-term care facility when they voluntarily rolls, rolls their hand and join the Minnesota National Guard. And I wholeheartedly wish we did not have to do this mission, but the fact of the matter is we are. These re residents in long-term care facilities are real people and they require real care. To date, the Minnesota National Guard has supported 17 long-term care facilities, and I'm certain, that, I'm certain that number will continue to grow. Fortunately for the state of Minnesota and the families of those who have residents in these facilities, I am confident our soldiers and airmen will perform this mission with professionalism, treating the residents of these facilities with care, dignity, and respect. I'm happy to say these soldiers and airmen are doing well. Some of my leaders visited these soldiers during on Thanksgiving Day. These service members talked about their interactions with residents who unfortunately had been isolated in quarantine and had, hadn't been able to see their loved ones in some cases for months. The residents were very gracious and so appreciative for the support and care given by our soldiers and airmen. I will quote one young soldier who said, training for my wartime mission is one thing, but helping people in our communities is why I serve in the National Guard. Undoubtedly, our service members would rather spend the holidays with friends and family, but they understand right now they have a mission for the greater good of Minnesota. That is what service, selfless service is all about. These National Guard Guardsmen left their families, their jobs, and schools because they were ordered to fill critical roles in the front line, uh, along the front line in the fight against COVID-19. But they can use your help. Contact tracing confirms that these long-term care facilities are being put at risk, not from inside their walls, but from outside. We need your help to lessen the community spread. And I'm begging you on behalf of the 13,000 soldiers and airmen in the Minnesota National Guard and their families, I ask you to please follow the simple rules. Wear a mask when you're in public. Limit your potential exposures when you can. Follow the CDC and Minnesota Department of Health recommendations and temporarily adjust your lifestyle to limit the spread of the disease. Doing this will help our healthcare workers, first responders, and other essential workers stay healthy and stay on the job. None of us like this, but all of us can make a difference if we work together in this fight. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Nate Shima, the Vice President of Operations for the Good Samaritan Society. Thank you. Governor Walls, Commissioner Malcolm, thank you for the invitation to join you here today and thank you uh, for your leadership and support of long-term care residents, frontline, wor uh, frontline workers, and certainly our, our families. I'd first like to share an experience we've just had in, in Black Duck, Minnesota, just over a week ago, where nearly half of our employees tested positive and nearly 24 out of 27 of our residents tested positive for COVID. While we had planned and prepared for these situations, it truly does take a village to respond in a, in a and to respond and navigate in a, a crazy time like this. And I'm just so grateful for the support of our governor, state and local officials, for the way that we've rallied and come together as a family. Within hours, we had five nurses that were uh, on site within our, uh, responding in a, on site through the coordination of local and state officials. And today I'm, I'm here to tell you that we have 12 nurses of all, from all kinds, from all over the state, uh, there to serve our, our residents. 
The Good Samaritan Society has 50 locations, skilled nursing facilities, and assisted livings across the state of Minnesota, from International Falls to Stillwater to St. James, Minnesota. Our focus continues to be on providing exceptional quality and faith-based care. We're deeply, great, deeply grateful to the frontline staff for their relentless commitment to caring for our residents throughout this pandemic. They have worked long hours and sacrificed immensely time with their families to be where they've been needed most to care for our, to care for our residents. These last several months have been emotionally and mentally challenging, not only for our residents, but, our, for our, but for our staff. They truly are our heroes. Why we're here today, each of us has a responsibility to slow the spread of this virus and, to pr and protect the most vulnerable in our communities. We know that COVID fatigue is real, but now is not the time to let our guard down. We continue to do everything we can to help our residents stay healthy and safe, and we need our, our community to do the same. Please continue to follow all the CD CDC guidelines, wearing a mask, avoiding crowds, washing your hands. Stay home if you're sick, and if you haven't gotten your flu shot yet, it's not too late. This virus does not discriminate. We're seeing widespread, we're seeing widespread cases across Minnesota and, and in the Twin Cities. And I stand here before, before you today to say that we've got over 200 residents and team members that are, are positive for COVID and we're relentlessly, relentlessly trying to contain it. Unfortunately, this has had an impact on our long-term care staffing and our residents. Overall cases have been up as a result of this community transmission and community spread, but we're better prepared today because of Governor Walz's plan and in our, in our, in the support of our long-term care community. We know that families and residents are anxious to be reunited with their loved ones. I'd love to see my, my four grandparents down in Faribault, Minnesota this Christmas time, but I just don't know that that's going to happen. For us to be, continue to be open to our doors to visitation and expand our, our ability to more family members, we need that positivity rate to keep coming down. As we fight this virus, we are also doing everything we can to combat isolation and loneliness. Our staff has always cared for our residents like family, but they've taken on some new responsibilities here lately. We owe a debt of gratitude to our employees who have uh, just jumped in to do a little bit of everything. They've uh, celebrated birthdays, the birth of gr new great-grandchildren, and wedding anniversaries as a, symbol of a, as, their as a symbol of their love for their residents. Our staff have continuously gone above and beyond to use technology. We've had 90-year-olds using FaceTime for the first time. And it's just so incredibly gratifying to see the different ways that we can come together. As difficult as this has been on everyone, we continue to hear from so many families who have thanked us for taking these extra precautions. Just recently down in Jackson, Minnesota, we had a, a resident write a letter to the editor thanking the governor, state officials, and the Good Samaritan Society for all the restrictions that they put in place to, ke to keep them safe. Looking ahead, hope is in sight. As you've heard the commissioner and Governor Wall say, the vaccine is on the horizon. And not to be too cheeky, we continue to say, like the Mandalorian in Star Wars, this is the way. This is the way out. Continue to stay vigilant. With the holidays just around the corner, we are encouraging people to get creative in how they celebrate this year. Without, without that means, whether that means family Zoom calls or celebrating apart, so hopefully we can celebrate together next year. We're all in this together. We will get through this, with, uh, but we need to continue to do our part to slow the spread and protect our most vulnerable in our long-term care settings. Thank you for this opportunity to be here today. We look forward to continuing to work with Governor Walls, the state of Minnesota, and all our officials. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Christine Dahlman, Springbrook. You missed the opportunity to say I have spoken. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Christine Dahlman, and I'm the executive director of Springbrook Village in La Crescent, Minnesota. Um, I'd like to discuss how community spread is affecting our assisted living facility, our residents, families, and staff. Um, we're located in La Crescent, Minnesota, which is just across the river from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, prior to the recent dramatic increase in community spread, we were actually able to open up to general visitors. Um, our residents and families were so excited when they felt that we were heading in the right direction. Um, unfortunately, um, with the dramatic community spread, um, we had to dial back a little bit um, and only allow the essential caregivers into the building. Even with that, um, one of our um, family members who is an essential caregiver um, tested positive uh, for COVID. And unfortunately, 
that resident um, tested positive shortly after as well. One of the tough things about COVID that you is that you can be contagious without even realizing it. It can spread so easily. Wearing your mask can help so much. Um, I understand that people have concerns about wearing their masks, but this is bigger than you or me. For the sake of our residents and families, please do your part. I want our facilities residents to be able to see their families and friends without being afraid that they will contract this virus or give it to one of their friends. All of our citizens are important. We have so much we can learn from our older generation. We, we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Now is not the time to turn our backs on um, how we can help them and how we can help each other in the process. Um, the faster we can come together for the common good of all of our citizens, the faster we can overcome this. I wear my mask not only to protect myself, but to protect others that I may come near. Um, none of us can control the, the actions of others. We can only control our own. The choice is yours. Will you help be part of the solution or be part of the problem? Thousands of seniors in long-term care facilities and thousands of family members across Minnesota want to see um, one another. They want to stay connected. We can't make that happen when community spread is so rampant. Hang in there, Minnesota. Be safe, be smart, and help our treasured seniors stay close to their friends and family. Thanks. Governor Lutz. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nate. Um, to all those folks working in these facilities, uh, during COVID, I continue to say it, of all the challenges, um, every day I see the, the beauty of human spirit step up, the folks who do care. Uh, there's a story almost every day of, of staff uh, bringing in a birthday cake, singing when the family can't be there, just things of what humans do for one another, and so I'm grateful. And, uh, and to General Mankey, once again, you're exactly right. Um, Myself have worn that uniform for 24 years. You got the call for flood duty or tornado duty or fire duty or call overseas. I would have never imagined working in a long-term care facility, but I think you're right. The folks who choose to join the National Guard care about their community. They come from that community. You've got folks that are taking off their civilian side, putting on that uniform. We have a responsibility to train them, to give them the tools necessary to go do that job. And I think for Minnesotans who are listening, um, these teams stand at the ready and the call can come almost immediately as these folks would tell you this cascades very quickly and all of a sudden one morning you don't know how you're going to care for residents because there's no one to do it that call goes in and the minnesota department of health those nurses and the national guard show up and do the work and do it with professionalism they do it with care and they do it with compassion but what i would ask all of you as we wrap up today if you want to and we hear this all the time and i am so thankful for this that in this country when somebody sees somebody in uniform, they show the respect to them and ask them what they can do to support them. Show them what they can do to support them. What can I do to help you? This is your opportunity. If you want to help the Minnesota National Guard, put that mask on. Stay socially distanced. And it is so simple. It's not even out of malice. You're filling up with gas. You don't have a mask. And you decide you're just going to run in and pay quickly. The person standing in line behind you may work in that long-term care facility. They may be that guard woman who's there who's just going home after duty and took off the uniform. Um, it's those types of things that are happening, that spread happens in the community. The next thing we know, it is in our long-term care facilities. And it's one thing to be an 18 to 35-year-old asymptomatic. It's quite another to be an 80-year-old resident of a long-term care facility where just because of the nature of that, it makes this disease much more deadly. So um, we'll get through this. We've got incredible people. You know that your neighbors are out there to help. Uh, you're hearing it time and time again. There is light at the end of the tunnel. That vaccine is setting out there, but it in and of itself is not going to fix this. It doesn't take away the need to mask, need to socially distance, wash your hands, stay home if you're sick, get a test if you have symptoms or you think you're going to be in a place where you might need to know that. So with that, Minnesotans, we're going to take a, a two-minute break here, come back on with our socially distanced and remote media and take questions from them. Thank you.